So today uh, we'd like to discuss slopes of curves that are described in polar coordinates. And our goal is to obtain a formula for the slope that's given purely in terms of, of the variable theta. In other words, we wish to not have to you know, convert the, the equation of our curve to x, y coordinates to simply find the slope of the curve at a given point. So, so, uh, and then we'd also like to then, you know, apply our formula to actually analyze a given polar curve. So that's our goal. So, so let's get started and, and see, see how this goes. <clears throat> so we know, of course, you know, that, that if we have a curve uh, described in the xy plane, that um, uh, the slope of the curve at a specified point is given by dy dx. In other words, the, the instantaneous rate of change in y with respect to x at the given point. Now remember the, the relationship between the xy Cartesian coordinates and the r theta polar coordinates of a given point. So let's take, for instance, this point p here in the first quadrant. So we know that um, uh, R would represent uh, the distance from P to the origin, okay? And the angle theta denotes the angle that the ray OP makes with the horizontal. In other words, the positive x-axis here. And so, so we could see in the figure uh, a right triangle that is formed, okay? And, uh, and uh, the x-coordinate of P, right, which represents the, the horizontal displacement of the point P from the origin, the x-coordinate of P represents this leg of the right triangle, right, which is a side adjacent to theta. And, uh, and, and the vertical displacement of P away from the origin, okay, is, is the length of this side of the right triangle, right, which is opposite to the angle theta. And so, so therefore, because the ratio of the adjacent to the hypotenuse is the cosine of theta, then the cosine of theta is x divided by r, which makes x equal to r cos theta. And because the sine of the angle theta is the ratio of the opposite side to the hypotenuse, so the sine of theta is y over r, which makes y equal to r sine theta. And so now, right, we have these uh, x, y, and r theta variables uh, related by these formulas, these two formulas. And therefore, if, if the polar curve uh, in the figure is the graph of r equals f of theta, then we could express x and y purely as a function of theta, right? Because r is f of theta, so x becomes f of theta cos theta, y being always r sine theta, becomes f of theta times sine theta. And so assuming that, that uh, our function f is a differentiable one, then the formula dy dx, uh, which again by definition means you know the limiting uh, rate of change of y with respect to x is the change in x tends to zero, that that, um, that limit could be expressed as a somewhat more complicated limit, right? We could take the change in y over the change in theta and divide that by the change in x over the change in theta, right? And algebraically, that, that ratio is equal to delta y over delta x. But you'll notice one other difference in, in this uh, last limit formula is we changed the limit to be on the change in x going to zero to having the change in theta go to zero. And to see why that's reasonable is, uh, you know, consider, okay, uh, there's just a portion, okay, of the graph of this curve. Okay, and here again is our point P, right? Here's a nearby point Q on the curve. And so we know that um, the slope of the line QP 
would be, you know, the change in y divided by the change in x between the points p and q. And you could see in this particular case, because q is, is to the left of p, that the, the change in x between p and q is actually a negative uh, change. Whereas uh, because q is above p, the change in y between q and p is a positive rate of change. And consequently, the slope of a line uh, qp is, is negative, right, as a uh, you know, you have a positive change in y over a negative change in x. And of course, as uh, as this increment in x goes to zero, okay, that's going to force q to move down the curve towards p. And then the Leibniz slope of that line qp becomes uh, the actual slope of the graph of this curve at point p. And, and that's what that, that's what we're seeking to find, the slope of the graph at P. And, and uh, notice that uh, as that occurs, right, as Q approaches P along the graph, uh, as, as this increment in X goes to zero, then the, the angle QOP, right, that angle also tends to zero. And that angle QOP is actually this, this delta theta. You know, as, as uh, the, the ray OQ makes an angle theta plus delta theta with the x-axis, as ray OP makes the angle theta with the x-axis. So, so the difference, this angle QOP delta theta, right, that that angle is going gonna, is gonna to close to zero, right, as that change in x goes to zero. And thus, uh, again... Um, in this limit formula, as the change in x goes to zero, that's going to force the change in theta to tend to zero. And so we could rewrite this uh, limit in this new formula formulation. And, and because the limit of a quotient is equal to the quotient of the limits, provided that the two limits exist, so therefore we could write this as a quotient of limits. And the, the limiting change in y with respect to theta as the change in theta goes to zero, uh, that would define dy d theta, the derivative of y with respect to theta, whereas the limit of delta x over delta theta as delta theta goes to zero is the derivative of x with respect to theta, right? And so, so again, you know, in, in, in more uh, detail, this change in y over change in theta would be the difference in, you know, the y-coordinates at q divided by the y-coordinate at p divided by delta theta, which would be uh, this numerator, and the change in x over the change in theta represents, you know, the difference in the x-coordinate of p with the x, the x-coordinate of q, sorry, minus the x-coordinate of p divided by the change in theta, right? So this is just simply an expansion of our, our limit formulation. And, and again, you know, because we were um, assuming that f is differentiable, then, then the, the numerator um, <coughs> dy d theta, uh, which is uh, uh, y uh, dy d theta is y being our sine theta is the derivative of, you know, f of theta sine theta, right, which is uh, what we had here, right, this is just an expansion of uh, the derivative of f of theta sine theta, in the denominator, uh, <coughs> the derivative of x with respect to theta is um, uh, <coughs> the, the derivative of r cos theta, or f of theta cos theta, and, and again, f being differentiable guarantees that the, the, the product of f times sine and f times cos are also differentiable due to the product rule, right? We know that the product of two differentiable functions is always differentiable. And so therefore, um, if our function f is differentiable, then we're guaranteed that the, the slope of the graph uh, at a specified point, r theta, uh, is given by the ratio of dy d theta 
divided by dx d theta. Okay, so with that in mind, you know, let's let's uh, take a specific uh, polar curve, namely r equals one plus cos theta. Uh, we're going to plot that graph uh, both in Cartesian and polar form, and then uh, analyze the slope of the polar graph as a function of theta. And so, so first, you know, we're just going to uh, plot. Um, the, the 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 rectangular plot okay of r equals one plus cos theta so you know we're plotting um, uh, r versus theta here as theta ranges from zero to two pi and thus we'll just end up with a, a standard cosine wave and so you know we we scaled our um, our theta axis from zero to two pi. Uh, in in multiples of, of pi over six, and um, and then you know our maximal R value is going to be of course one plus one or two. So so let's you know scale our our R axis here. Uh, let's say from zero to two. Okay, and so um, so of course when when theta is zero, the cosine is its maximal value of one. Therefore R is going to be maximized as well. R would be two uh, when theta is zero. And say we let theta be pi over three, so the cosine is a half, which makes our one and a half, you know, three halves at, at pi over, at pi over three. Right? The R value is three halves. Okay, uh, at pi over two, uh, the cosine is is zero, so R is exactly one. So we're at this point, you know, pi over 2, 1. At 2 pi over 3, now into the second quadrant, the cosine is negative 1 half. So R is, is 1 half at 2 pi over 3. Okay, and then let's say we go out to pi, right, where the cosine is minimized. Cosine is minus 1. So R is exactly 0 at pi. Okay, and then going through the third quadrant angle, so say, for instance, at 4 pi over 3, the cosine's back to negative a half. So r is uh, 1 half. Uh, at 3 pi over 2, right, the cosine's back to 0, which is going to make our r value equal to 1, right? And then, say, in the fourth quadrant now, say, 5 pi over 3, now the cosine is positive 1 half, so R is going to be back to one and a half or three halves. And finally, at say two pi, right, the cosine is back to its original value one, which makes R a maximum again, you know, of two. And so, you know, we have a, a standard cosine wave here in our figure. Um, so it's going to look, you know, something like this. You know, um, it's going to be initially concave down as theta ranges from 0 to pi over 2 and then it'll curve concave up between pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2 right and then then it's going to shift again concave down from 3 pi over 2 to 2 pi and so you know we have a, a standard sort of a a cosine wave it's just been you know raise one unit vertically because we added one to the cosine of theta here on the right side of the equal sign. So here's our, our just our standard Cartesian plot of r equals to one plus cos theta. So let's, uh, uh, you know, label uh, these points that we indicated on the graph. Say so we call the first point A and so on B. C, D, E, F, G, H, and I. Okay, and so so if we wish to then uh, uh, transform the graph from a, a Cartesian plot of the curve to to a polar plot, then then we're we're thinking of essentially plotting in the um, the x y plane. We're now in the um, the R value, again, is going to represent the, the angle 
that will be made with the positive x-axis and um, <clears throat> the, the, the theta would make, be the angle made with the positive x-axis and of course r is a distance away from the origin and so so our initial point a if you recall had theta equal to zero and r equal to two right and two was the maximal r value so here you know in our in our x y plane we'll we'll label some distances like all of these points are one unit away from the origin say here this circle represents a circle of radius two points two units away from the origin and so our initial point um, with an r value of two when theta is zero would lie in this position right on the positive x-axis so that this this uh, angle is makes an angle of zero uh, radians with a positive x-axis and the distance from the point to the origin of course is two so so this would be say our, our um, uh, uh, the the uh, transformed uh, point A in, in in the polar in the polar sense, and uh, the point B, if you recall, had um, an R value of three halves when theta was pi over three. So now we're going to move you know to the ray theta equals pi over three, go out three half units from the origin. And, and this this would be the image of our point B. I'll call it B prime, okay, with, with an R value of three halves when, when theta is pi over three, and, and so on. And so our third point C hit an R value of one when theta was pi over two. So its image in, in, in the polar plot would be here on a positive Y axis on a circle of radius one. The next point uh, had a theta value of 2 pi over 3, and r was 1 half, okay? So, so the polar transformation would put that point here. We'll call that point d prime, okay? And then our next point uh, had theta equals to pi and an r value of 0. So that would be the point, therefore, because r is 0, it's a point right at the pole. Okay, or in other words, like the origin, okay, of our uh, xy coordinate system. And that's our point e prime. The next point um, was had a theta of four pi over three and the r value of one half. So this would be the location of its polar representation, um, <coughs> uh, one half for r, four pi over three for theta, and. Uh, the, the next point was at 3 pi over 2 with an r value of 1, right? So that would put our point right down here. Okay, we we'll call that point, say, g prime. Um, and, and our next point, we had theta 5 pi over 3, and r was now 3 halves. So the point uh, h prime is right here. And then finally, our last point, uh, is the point with uh, r is is equal to two when theta is two pi, right? So so that's actually back at our initial point uh, a prime. So our our final point i prime coincides with the initial point a prime, and so you could see what happens, right? That is theta was continuously increasing from zero to pi. Okay, uh, the R value was continuously decreasing from two down to zero. So the graph like is spiraling in towards the origin and reaches the origin along the, uh, the, the theta equals to pi, okay, ray. Okay, so, so the graph uh, is, is, something, is something like this. Okay, and, and you know, it's a nice smooth, smooth curve that was uh, again, spiraling into the origin as theta increased from zero to pi. And then symmetrically, the graph spirals away from the origin as theta ranges from pi out to two pi. 
And so now the graph of the polar curve comes like this. Okay, so this is uh, the polar plot of r equals to 1 plus the cosine theta. Okay, and so um, so what, what we would like to do is to analyze the slope of its graph uh, at, at various points, specifically maybe these points that we, we label in a picture. So, but, but in general, you know, the slope uh, of the polar plot uh, of this curve, which is called a cardioid, being heart-shaped, uh, at, at the general point, uh, say, P equaling x comma y, we know that that is given by the formula m for slope, right, is the value of the derivative of y with respect to x at the point P, which, you know, we said that uh, we could represent in polar form y is r sine theta, and so we could differentiate r sine theta with respect to theta, divide that by the derivative of x with respect to theta, dy d theta over dx d theta, which would be r cos theta differentiated with respect to theta. But remember that, you know, r is 1 plus cos theta. So we write uh, in the numerator uh, 1 plus cos theta in place of r, multiply that by the sine of theta, differentiate that product, divide by 1 plus the cos theta, multiplied by the cos theta, differentiate that product with respect to theta. Okay, so then just, you know, writing that out, you know, using the, the product rule to differentiate, we will see indeed that um, uh, <laughs> the derivative is equal to uh, the first factor, 1 plus cos theta, times the derivative of the sine of theta, which is the cosine theta, right, plus the second factor, sine theta, times the derivative of 1 plus cosine theta, which is minus the sine of theta. Okay, and then that gets divided by the derivative of the denominator, which is 1 plus cos theta times derivative of cos, right, is minus the sine of theta, plus the second factor, cos theta, times the derivative of 1 plus cosine, right, so that's going to be, again, uh, minus the sine of theta. Okay, and so if we kind of expand that a little bit, right, uh, distributing the cosine, right, we'll get uh, a cos positive cosine theta, and then a positive cosine squared theta minus sine squared theta. So we could write that, say, the cosine squared first plus the cos theta minus the sine squared theta, all divided by, okay, in the denominator we have, see, a minus sine theta, minus sine theta cos theta, another minus sine theta cos theta. So it's basically minus sine theta minus 2 sine theta times cos theta. Okay, so that's our formula for the, for the derivative, okay, uh, 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 of, of uh, this cardioid, uh, just given purely in terms of uh, the angle theta. Okay, theta ranges from 0 to 2 pi. Okay, and so, uh, but but let's see if we can we can make that formula even look look a little simpler. Uh, what we could do is, you know, we could say we could replace the sine squared of theta if we wish uh, in terms of the cosine squared of theta in the numerator. Okay, so if we simply uh, use the fact. Okay, that, um, you know, the sine squared of theta is equal to 1 minus the cos squared theta, 
okay to write okay then um, the the numerator as the cosine so my slope m is the cosine squared theta uh, plus okay the cosine theta and then my minus sine squared of theta becomes minus the quantity 1 minus the cosine squared of theta. All right, I'll divide it by, and the denominator, we're going to leave the same. Uh, all we'll do maybe is do a little factorization. We could factor out a minus sine of theta from both terms. So then we'd have minus sine theta times a quantity 1 plus 2 cos theta. Okay. But then, you know, you'll notice that here in the numerator, okay, we have uh, the minus, the minus cosine squared would be a positive cosine squared. So we'll actually end up with uh, the numerator reducing to 2 cosine squared theta, okay, and then we have this positive cos theta, and then this minus 1 all over the minus sine theta times 1 plus 2 cos theta, okay? And, uh, and what we could do at this point is we could factor the numerator, okay? And so the numerator will factor as follows. Um, we could say, uh, uh, in terms of, you know, thinking of the numerator as a quadratic expression in, in the cosine of theta, we would have like 2 cos theta minus 1 as one factor. The other factor is the cosine of theta plus 1. Okay, so that when we, we expand this, right, we get 2 cosine squared of theta plus the cosine theta minus 1. Okay, and now the denominator uh, will factor as well. Uh, namely, we have uh, a minus the sine of theta. Okay, so let's put minus sine theta times uh, the factor, uh, you know, 1 plus 2 cos theta. Okay, so we just could rewrite it like that. And, um, and, and what we notice is that uh, the, um, <clears throat> this first factor in the numerator is 2 cos theta minus 1. And, and you could note that uh, that particular factor, 2 cos theta minus 1, would, would in fact equal to 0, right, whenever, of course, the cosine of theta is 1 half, right? And so, so there's two angles between 0 and 2 pi for which that's true, namely in the second, uh, in the first, rather, and, and fourth quadrants. Right, when theta is either pi over 3 or 5 pi over 3. Right, this, this first factor is going uh, to be 0, which in fact is going to make the whole product 0. And so in other words, the, the slope of the polar graph of the cardioid uh, is in fact uh, going to be 0 at these angles pi over 3 and 5, over, 5 pi over 3. So in other words, uh, m is equal to 0 at the points on our graph, which were labeled as p, b prime and h prime. And thus, uh, you know, the graph has horizontal tangent lines at these two points. Tangent lines uh, at both b prime and h prime. So, so let's just, uh, again, uh, reference our picture again and see if that seems reasonable, right? So here is the, the graph of our cardioid. And, and so, so we could see at, uh, at b prime and h prime that those are going to be like, in other words, the high and low points on the graph where, where the, uh, the, the tangent line is in fact a uh, horizontal, you know, zero slope to the graph at those two points. Okay, fine. So, so we see that's true. And now uh, consider the uh, this this one plus two cos theta factor. Okay, in the denominator, 
and and we could note that that factor, you know, one plus two cos theta, that that would be zero. Of course, only if the cosine of theta is minus one half. So that's going to require that theta be a second or third quadrant angle, namely either two pi over three or four pi over three. Okay. And and furthermore, uh, the other factor in the denominator is the sine of theta, right? Also, you know, the sine of theta, that that would be zero, right? That, of course, would be true uh, if uh, theta is equal to, say, you know, zero pi or two pi. Those would be the angles in the first, uh, you know, between zero and two pi at which the sine of theta would be zero. So, so what could we say, you know, is happening to the graph uh, of the cardioid uh, when we reach these, these various angles, okay, uh, where, where the denominator uh, of the slope formula becomes zero? Well, so, so yeah, so now since uh, when we take the limit, you know, of the... the the magnitude of dy dx is our angle of theta approaches any of these angles, um, uh, <clears throat> let's say, for uh, the angle theta zero to be either the angle zero or, or the angle two pi over three or the angle four pi over three or the angle two pi. So, so what's happening? Okay, remember this, right? This slope, right? This is also our dy dx formula, right? And so, so at any four of the, at any of these four angles, what's happening is our denominator uh, tends to zero as theta approaches any of those angles, but the numerator tends to a non-zero value. So, so, so in magnitude, you know, if we have something non-zero divided by something converging to zero, the limiting value becomes, you know, infinite, okay? And again, in the positive sense in this case, because, you know, absolute value. And so, so what that's uh, indicating is that uh, the, 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 the graph, right, the slope of the graph is becoming uh, infinitely steep as theta approaches any one of these four angles. And so, since this is true, we will see that the graph, in fact, has uh, vertical tangent lines. Okay, uh, at the points, uh, so remember, when, when theta was zero or two pi, that gave us the point A prime, which was equivalent to I prime, at 2 pi over 3, that was the, the d prime point, and when theta was 4 pi over 3, we were at f prime. So again, if we go back and refer back to our plot of the um, cardioid, so yeah, you could see at this, this initial internal point, you know, we have a, a vertical tangent line, as we also have as the, at these points d prime, and f prime. So, so in other words, you know, point further to the right, right on the graph of, of the cardioid is this point a prime equal to i prime. The points further to the left on the graph of the cardioid, the other two points where we have the vertical tangents are at d prime and f prime. Okay, and, and you might have noticed that when we were we were doing this analysis here where we were looking at the points, okay, where a um, uh, factor in the denominator was zero, that we excluded uh, the value um, <clears throat> theta equals pi, okay, uh, where, where uh, the, the denominator is zero. And that was because if you notice that when theta equals pi, not only is, is the sine of theta going to be zero, but also the cosine of pi plus one would be zero. So, so we would get a zero over zero type indeterminate limit 
as as theta approaches zero. So so it happens that so so let's let's also investigate a little bit more carefully what happens to the slope of the graph as theta approaches zero. So so I'll just say to note that the limit as theta approaches zero for dy dx, you know, would be the lim as theta approaches zero of this, you know, this product here, right? Two cos theta minus one times cos theta plus one, right? All divided by minus sine theta times one plus two cos theta, right? And, and as theta approaches zero, cosine goes to one. So, so, um, I, I, I'm sorry, we, we were going to, we were supposed to look at, I'm sorry, the point here was when theta was approaching pi. So we wanted theta, sorry, we wanted here, right, the point, right, was when theta approaches pi, not zero. I'm sorry. We wanted to investigate this specific limit, and as theta approaches pi, right, that's where the 2 cos pi minus 1 is minus 2 minus 1 is minus 3, but yeah, the cosine of pi, you know, is minus 1, so this second factor went to zero. In the denominator here, right, we get the sine of pi is zero. And and one minus two cos pi, one minus two is minus one. So so yeah, you can indeed see, right, that we have the, the zero over zero indeterminacy, you know, as theta approaches pi. And so so the question is, yeah, specifically what 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 is if the value of this of this limit and and so to to, to investigate its value let, let's just kind of rewrite the limit as a product of two limits okay so as theta approaches pi i'm going to first um consider you know this this ratio because it, it's not uh an indeterminate uh, ratio as theta approaches pi you know because the two cos theta minus one is approaching minus three. One plus two cos theta, you know, is approaching minus one. So this is 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 not indeterminate. But the second the second um, ratio, namely the cos theta plus one over uh, the sine of theta, that would become indeterminate. You know, zero over zero. And you know, we also have this minus sign, okay, in the denominator. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm just because it's a constant factor. I'm just going to bring out that factor, okay, minus one up in front of the product of the two limits, okay. And so, yeah. So this this limit is not a problem. We know that this converges to you know the minus three over minus one is equal to three, right? But but this is the uh, part that's going to, uh, you know, zero divided by zero. And so, so there's a number of ways that we could evaluate this indeterminate limit. One would simply be, uh, say we multiply sort of by the conjugate of the, the term in the numerator. In other words, if we multiply by, say, uh, the cos theta minus one over the cos theta minus one, then we find that uh, the limit, you know, as theta approaches pi, okay, of um, <coughs> dy dx to be, uh, well, we have this, you know, minus one, you know, times is three, times the limit now as theta approaches pi of um, the cosine squared of theta minus one over the sine of theta times uh, the cosine of theta minus one and if we simply uh, if we factor out a minus one in the numerator okay then uh, you know we bring that factor in front of the limit operator so then we would get positive three say times the limit as theta approaches pi of one minus the cosine squared of theta divided by uh, the sine of theta times cos theta minus one. And now the reason for, for making this, uh, for multiplying here by the conjugate term is so now we could replace the one minus cosine squared 
of theta by its equivalency, namely the sine squared of theta. And so now we could, you know, we could cancel a factor of sine theta from numerator and denominator. And so we end up with three times the limit, okay, as theta approaches zero of simply the sine of theta divided by the cosine of theta minus one. Okay, and now this limit here, okay, this limit is no longer indeterminate, right, as um, the cosine of, of, um, of, of uh, theta minus one, uh, again, this is the limit, of course, on theta, right, theta approaching pi, not, not zero, right, as theta approaches pi, the cosine of pi, again, you know, tending to minus one, so we get like the sine of pi zero over minus two, or, or the limit here is zero. Okay, and so so our conclusion is that in fact the the graph uh, has a slope of zero. Okay, or in other words, therefore the, the graph will have a horizontal tangent line at the point at the origin, which is the point e prime. So thus uh, the graph. Uh, has a horizontal tangent line uh, at the point uh, E prime. Okay, and so again, we look back at our picture and we see that indeed, you know, it does make sense that at this point at the origin, we can see that both from theta approaching pi through values less than pi and through values greater than pi, right, the limiting slope is zero. The graph has a horizontal tangent line. And so, so, um, so that was our, I think, our conclusion of this uh, lecture on um, the slopes of curves described in polar coordinates. So, so I, I hope you enjoyed watching. Uh, thank, thank you.